So I was homeschooled from the time I was in kindergarten all the way up to my junior year in high school or 11th grade. I then went to a public high school for my senior year and then later attended Cornell University for my bachelor's and master's. So I get asked about being homeschooled quite a bit and typically the questions are around, you know, how did I learn to socialize with peers? Uh, how did I prepare myself to get into college when you're, you know, learning from your parents? And then more kind of, well, less often, uh, I get sort of questions on what do I feel I missed out on and do I sort of harbor any resentment towards the educational choices my parents made for me? So in general, uh, <laughs> I feel like it went well, but by no means is this video an endorsement of homeschooling broadly. Um, I have a little bit of context within my family that I feel comfortable and have strong opinions about. I am the second oldest of four, so I have an older brother and two younger sisters, all of whom are homeschooled entirely from kindergarten to, to high school. And at that time, I'm 45 years old, homeschooling was not that common back in the day. It was pretty, pretty rare compared to what it is now. And that being said, we were around a lot of other homeschooled families. And in general, my family has a pretty positive outlook towards it. But uh, having seen a bunch of my homeschooled peers all grow up uh, with various uh, different strategies to how they were educated at home, it didn't necessarily go as well for everybody. Um, so I think context matters a lot. And the first place that we'll talk about context is in the form of socialization. So broadly speaking, socializing for homeschoolers in a suburban environment where there's lots of other families and kids within a bike ride or, or walk away becomes a lot easier than it did for my homeschooled peers that were growing up on a five acre farm, for example. Um, I think the parents' intentions for why they're homeschooling matters a lot. And the broadest sort of advice I can kind of give, or not advice, but this observation, homeschooling in general goes well when the parent's intent is to make the children's world broader, deeper, more nuanced, and more adventurous. It goes pretty terribly when it's the parent's intent is to make everything smaller, more controlled, and more rigid with singular answers. And that's no sort of knock on people that do it for strong religious motivations and versus those that don't. But it's how that consideration gets incorporated into sort of strict control versus sort of allowing the children to sort of develop within a, an environment that's tailored to them. So when it's tailored to the individual nuances of each child and even within my siblings, there's such a huge discrepancy of, of interest and abilities and uh, self-motivation. And when it's sort of a one size fit all, you, that's solely from the parent's worldview, it tends to sort of lose the competitive advantage, which is that sort of individual curation for a particular mind's interest. So I called my mom before I recorded this to kind of uh, brush up and, and clarify exactly what her intentions are. I mean, I kind of knew what they were, but uh, always good before you go uh, on camera to get the endorsement from the primary source. She was influenced by an author named Raymond Moore. And by no means, by no means am I endorsing anything he has written or done. But at the time, and this was a long time ago, no internet, she was sort of reading about childhood development and she was interested in some of the narratives and ideas that he sort of presented. She disagreed with a lot of the other things, but um, in general is the idea that boys in particular, and since the, her two oldest were, were boys, um, were kind that it maybe wasn't great to intensely focus on reading at five or six. That, you know, let the eyes sort of develop, let them sort of, you know, work their sort of larger muscles, do more active hands-on stuff. He sort of cited some anecdotal uh, studies about how Japanese emperors were raised, where it was like going out into nature, doing more hands-on. And in general, she thought she would enjoy sort of teaching us herself. And she thought that, you know, well, if that seems to be kind of in general, the way sort of boys develop, like, 
let me let me try it out and if it doesn't work they she can kind of catch up later so she never had the intent to homeschool us as long as she did she was interested in it for those sort of early childhood development years and then ended up sort of sticking with it a little bit longer so we didn't really have a focused reading or math program at the sort of age of kindergarten to first grade. Everything was like hikes in nature, going to the local museums, doing lots of art projects, lots of crafts. She read to us a lot. So she, and she tended to focus on books that she actually wanted to read. So it tended to be the classics. Although I think it started with uh, Little House on the Prairie, Swiss Family Robinson, then kind of worked its way into the work of Mark Twain and then Charles Dickens and then books like Les Miserables with a little supplement of uh, Little Women, I think was mixed in there, and then also Pride and Prejudice. So she tended to focus on the, the books that she enjoyed as a young adult and adult and would read them to us while we sort of played with Legos. Uh, there was not formal sort of experiments into sort of biology, but we would go to the Natural History Museum. We had a lot of schedule flexibility since we didn't have to get up, get to a bus, get there on time, get picked up. Um, and we were able to go fishing with my dad. We did a lot of uh, outdoor kind of stuff. We lived in the suburban neighborhoods. We could play outside, but it wasn't like it was in the middle of this ideal wilderness. And we weren't allowed to watch TV. We had a TV, it was originally black and white and then, and then color. But it was, we weren't allowed to turn it on without sort of explicit parental sort of approval. So it stayed mostly off. So even though there wasn't like a formal push on here, here's your letters, here's how to read. We were kind of drawn towards reading as a sense of entertainment, which ended up being pretty compelling. Um, so I ended up sort of learning to read for my own entertainment around seven or eight, um, and then me and my brother, I remember who's two years older, we would go to the local library with a wagon, bring back a bunch of books. And from there, it was a, you know, reading was almost like screen time, I guess, to the, what it is to kids now, where my mom had a really hard time of stealing our, our flashlights and confiscating them so we wouldn't stay up past our bedtimes, hiding under a blanket with a flashlight, reading the, the Hardy Boys and the Boxcar Children or, or whatever else we sort of found entertaining for our, our own leisure. The sort of rule on screen time kind of shifted around, uh, I think around like 87. Um, and that's when I think the, the, or maybe 85, no, it's around 85, I think is when our sort of screen time focus shifted a little bit. That's when we got a, a Nintendo. And you would, might think that, you know, video games are this really destructive thing, but it was actually a really important catalyst along with sports for socializing. So in general, I would say sports and video games were actually really fantastic catalysts for allowing us as homeschool kids to socialize with other kids in the neighborhood. So the first kid on our block to get a Nintendo got it right away. He was, he was Japanese and you know his parents, I think, got the sort of a Japanese version right when the Nintendo came out and immediately everyone was into it. So. My brother and I, uh, of course, really wanted one, um, but they were super expensive. I think they were like 120 bucks. I think they were over $100 uh, at the time, which was just an extraordinary amount of money. Well, my mom sort of outlined, a, you know, said, hey, we're not buying this for you guys, but if you want it, you have to figure out a way to earn money. And in general, we had learned a lot of math through sort of uh, buying our own stuff. If we ever had candy, we'd have to do a chore get the money and then go to the store so we could add, subtract and learn it from a very practical sense. So I think the earliest math lesson we had was through the game Parcheesi, you know, counting up the dice and all of that. And then later it sort of became through learning math through money rather than eventually trying to learn money from math, uh, which I think is practical, but not necessarily conducive for the most elevated levels of mathematical ability. So. I think our first entrepreneurial thing, other than just sort of doing chores, which was much more like an institutional job handed down by the family structure, um, you know, doing the dishes, I think, I think for doing the dishes and taking out the trash, my earliest memory of getting paid was getting 25 cents a week for taking out the trash and rinsing the dishes. And my brother got 25 cents a week for washing the dishes that I would sort of rinse. So 
you know, when you're making that kind of money, saving up for a hundred dollars is is considerable. So we need to turbocharge it a little bit. So um, my mom kind of outlined a vision because my brother and I had always sort of been into cooking. That's another thing. Your home economic skills when you're homeschool can be quite strong, uh, since you are the cafeteria worker in addition to the diner. We had this recipe for very simple shortbread cookies. It was just butter, flour, and sh brown sugar. And you could add chocolate chips or walnuts to them or whatever. So we took graph paper and we drew like an order form with the different types of cookies and the different additions, the delivery date for when they wanted them delivered to their house. We then went and got those uh, that sort of hand-drawn graph paper order form uh, photocopied and then went, knocked on all the doors. I think I was like, I don't know. It was, I was probably like eight or nine. And so my brother was like 10 or 11. So we took, went door to door, um, you know, put on our best clothes because you want to make a good impression when you're doing sales. And we'd hand them to, and I think it was, we were selling them for a dollar a dozen. And we they, we would deliver them within sort of our <laughs> awake, non, non-sleeping hours, uh, pretty much within an hour. And what we did is we made all the dough and you roll shortbread into sort of logs and wax paper and then you slice them and throw them in the oven right before, about 15 minutes before you need to deliver them. So we'd make all the dough in advance. You could add the chocolate chips just by pushing it into the sliced uh, little dough things afterwards. And I think over the course of one summer, we made about, I think about like right around like just under $100. And so we gave that to my mom and they were able to get us the Nintendo. Having Nintendo as sort of like the second family in the neighborhood was a great social catalyst. We had like Super Mario Brothers, I think, within the first year that it came out. I think it was 85. Um, and that became sort of a social magnet. We had like sort of, you know, uh, a fun house to sort of hang out in, uh, despite my parents' very limited sort of economic means. And... Yeah, that was actually a great tool for socialization because we'd sort of get around the same console with the two controls and, and sort of play it out. Um, sports are sort of the more obvious choice. My mom enrolled us really early into like AYSO soccer. Uh, my brother and I really didn't love soccer. Uh, <laughs> uh, my sisters were enrolled in sort of uh, music, played the violin, piano, cello. They made a lot of friends through those sort of activities from recitals to practices to sort of little mini orchestras. And so those kind of extracurricular activities were, were strong, but in terms of actually creating a magnet to bring other kids to, to your particular house, um, you know, unless you have a tree house, which we did, which also becomes like quite a draw uh, to the other kids in the neighborhood, we were able to sort of like socialize in a variety of different ways. Um, video games were something that I think like a lot of kids we really enjoyed and my parents were always pretty good at like not being so strict that like you get exactly this many minutes it was more by feel like if she, my mom sort of saw us uh, sitting in front of there for like more than two hours she would start to uh, start to threaten to take the controls but um, in general wasn't wasn't sort of too bad the other thing as it relates to sort of socialization is I think it was, I think it impacts the order of children differently. So I think it was probably a little harder socially. I think my brother probably had a little more FOMO than I did. And uh, I think my older sister probably did a little bit more than uh, my youngest sister. So there's kind of a, you know, me and my brother are two years apart, then there's a bit of a gap, and then my two sisters are two years apart. And so... You know, I think there was more cases where my brother was probably he had just, just a little bit of fear of missing out um, from kids his age or older, where I kind of had the benefit of being able to hang out with his friends, which were older than me, and then my own friends and stuff like that. So uh, I do think it is different depending on your sort of uh, your order in, in that sort of role. Obviously, sort of temperament matters a lot. Uh, I think for my older brother, Nate, and for Emily, they're more sort of, I think, naturally social um and for me and jesse we're definitely like to sort of be in social circles but are also very content sort of being left to our own devices pursuing something uh you know whether it be arts and crafts when we were young or now sort of building things and and so on so i think it's 
it's, again, it's why like I have a hard time endorsing homeschooling as like a blanket statement. Um, it's probably something that should really be considered relative to the development steps that that individual child is showing. Another really important aspect of homeschooling is a humble consideration from the parent standpoint that their worldview, including religious, political, scientific knowledge, mathematics, is by no means complete. And their intent was probably and motivation to be good teachers and instructors and role models for children is outstanding, um, especially compared to, you know, less than average sort of public schools where, where students can act or where the teachers can be under a lot of pressure and not necessarily be well compensated. I think humbleness from the parents really, really matters because if the approach is, here's the correct answer for everything. Here's how to think politically. Here's how to think spiritually. Here's the correct take on faith. The children are only getting one source. They don't have a biology teacher that's passionate about that. And then a math teacher that's passionate about that, that also have sort of intersecting different worldviews. It's kind of like gardening at home and growing your own vegetables is great. And so you might think like, well, I don't trust these sort of big, you know, institutional farms and for great reason. But if the answer is to sort of consolidate all of your food to your like one or two acre little mini farm, you probably have a good shot at getting things that are really important to your particular nutritional values. You can really control uh, a lot of things. You know that the animals were raised well. You know that the cows were fed grass, right? You know that you didn't use pesticides. But with, when, with all those sort of good things come sort of consolidated liabilities, right? Like meaning if the groundwater in your lot is contaminated with some sort of heavy metal that you don't know about, everything you're eating has that contamination. And that's what I saw with a lot of homeschooling sort of families is that if you limit the sources to two people that really, really care about their kids with great intentions, fantastic. The level of care is, is probably going to be pretty superior and outstanding. But any sort of lingering detriments or sort of philosophical flaws or ideological inconsistencies are also going to be concentrated from the parents to those children. And I think that's probably the hardest point is parents that it seems that, that choose to homeschool their kids uh, tend to have pretty strong reasons for doing it. And in the families where I've seen, you know, where now a lot of the homeschool kids I know are not on speaking terms with their parents, which is, which is tragic. It's, it's a terrible thing. It wasn't because the parents' intention were bad. I think they overestimated their children's allegiance to their worldview and sort of fundamentally didn't treat their children at a young stage as having the intellectual potential to be smarter than them, more adventurous, more curious than them. And I think that's, you know, one of the lessons I sort of take from that is if you want to do it to limit sort of the bad things that your child might learn that you think are incorrect, you better have a pretty high estimation of how brilliant, successful, creative, nuanced, philosophical you are as an individual. And if you start feeling that way, I would, I would sort of check yourself and see if your sort of track record of accomplishments really live up to your estimation. Because if you become the sort of, uh, it's very easy to go from the teacher to the jailer. And maybe it works for a few of the kids, but uh, there probably will be a point where the kids are paying attention to technology and media that you're not aware of, that contradicts what you're saying from peers that are more charismatic than you are as a parent. And suddenly they feel like they've been lied to or at the very least like fed too strict of a diet. Um, so I think like in general, strong, strong beliefs 
fantastic. But the humility to kind of acknowledge and in real time sort of let your children know, this is what we think as a family. This is what we sort of believe in. Um, but also being kind of objective about, hey, we're also, and this is what my parents were, were I think, pretty good at. They were able to sort of separate what they were sort of strongly convicted about but also sort of saying, hey, we're not the most accomplished people in the world. There's people that know way more than we do about a variety of subject matter. So humility goes a long way when you're the the, the sole teacher. And uh, don't let sort of becoming a teacher turn into the sort of perception that you're a jailer. So to sort of recap my early education, there was no formal school uh, from kindergarten till eight years old. It was around eight is when we actually had school time where we'd have lesson plans and stuff like that. So everything before eight was all kind of hands-on museums, hikes. We'd go to the local creek, catch uh, tadpoles, try to grow them into frogs. We would do plant seeds and, and grow things. We learned how to cook. We did chores. Um, didn't really do youth sports till around like more nine or 10. Um, we did like, you know, we'd go to the local YMCA for, for swimming. We would read for education because there wasn't a lot of, uh, television time. And I think it was, you know, didn't do any standardized testing until the end of sixth grade. Um, so everything was kind of very loose up until eight. And then sort of semi-formal with my mom sort of just doing her best from sort of, you know, grade appropriate uh, textbooks that she got. And, you know, probably three to four hours a day is what we would typically sort of spend on sort of actually sitting at a table and, and doing things. There was the option, though, for, you know, for history, for example, is you'd go through a textbook and kind of read it to me and my brother. And if we showed a particular interest in a moment or time, then she would dive into sort of an autobiography or like a specific uh, book to sort of deeper dive. And that was kind of really interesting because it allowed her to kind of adapt in real time to what we were the most motivated to retain rather than just the constant barrage of like, oh, you're this old, so you're learning about Napoleon. Um, and would then often sort of shift perspective and, you know, to like, oh, well, here's a tale of two cities or here's Les Miserables. And this is how you'll get sort of a more narrative perspective on, on the, the French Revolution. Um, learning, you know, reading Mark Twain was a great way to learn about that era of American history um, with all its sort of flaws. And then also its sort of nostalgic nuance and funny little uh, uh, turns of phrases from, from ancient times. Um, so standardized testing, she was able to get a standardized test, like a standard Scantron and, you know, sort of essays and stuff like that. Um, there's no online kind of place to buy those things. So I'm not sure exactly where she got it off to sort of figure that out. Um, but she was very kind of apprehensive of like, okay, the first standardized test, end of sixth grade, you know, she was kind of terrified that where we'd sort of measure up. So my brother and I tested well above average for everything except spelling, which was just average. And to this day, I am terrible at spelling uh, compared to well, my, my peers of a similar sort of educational level. Um, I'm not sure if that's just uh, unique to our, uh, our, our, our biology um, or if that was a product of that, but she was pretty relieved to, to sort of see that we moved from Santa Barbara in a small, small duplex with all four of us kids in, in one room uh, to a three bedroom, two bathroom suburban house in Bealton, which is about 30 miles north. Um, also a really nice sort of neighborhood with uh, lots of kids, very modest sort of middle to sort of lower income kind of families. But there's a lot of kids in our peer group. That's when we really sort of uh, started really getting into sports um, with soccer and then later football for me. The other kind of thing that uh, immediately sort of shifted was we were interested in sort of crafting. My mom loved sort of drawing and we went from sort of drawing to sort of playing with sticks, um, making wooden swords. We used a few of my dad's sort of hand saws and, and uh, hammers and nails to kind of make some crude stuff. My parents kind of saw that we were interested in that. And 
they would always kind of consult with us on what they would get us for Christmas um, and kind of explain to us what it would cost and what the sort of economic limits of the family were. And my brother and I got a bandsaw, I believe when I was about 11. Um, and that really started the sort of maker kind of woodworking journey. I think one Christmas we got a, actually, no, I think it was when I was 10. Got a bandsaw when I was 10 it was for both me and my brother, sort of a joint gift. Our Christmas presents, you know, typically revolved between a Nintendo game, Lego sets, or some sort of power or woodworking tools. Um, and the bandsaw really unlocked a lot. We both started making, you know, expanded our ability to make components that we would then build forts out of. It uh, expanded our abilities to make wooden swords, which made us popular in the neighborhood. We learned how to make crossbows and bows and arrows and all the other things that I don't know why it always turns towards uh, uh, faux weaponry. Um, and then later on, I think by the time I was about 13, uh, some of the other homeschooled families hired me and my brother to sort of teach woodworking to their kids that were a little bit younger. So again, it's sort of that kind of interest first was sort of cooking because, you know, you want to eat treats and if there isn't money for a lot of uh, off the shelf candy, you make cookies. And then later for sort of, you know, making wooden swords to boats and toys and, and little sort of uh, boxes and such uh, turned into another business to sort of you know, teaching wood shop to, to families that didn't have wood shops. Um, so it seems pretty wild when I look back uh, that, you know, the amount of sort of latitude they gave us with power tools, but they were always pretty trusting. We had done a lot of sort of outdoor things like fishing and camping. So there's kind of a general, I think, physical competency and sort of sure handedness um, from, you know, climbing a lot of trees and, and, and climbing rocks and such with, Things like fishing where you have to, you know, my dad was always pretty good. If we caught it, we had to sort of clean it. You kind of get used to getting your hands dirty and feeling the resistance of cutting something. Um, and with all that kind of exposure, normally it seems probably pretty dangerous at first. But, you know, kids are, I was always pretty fearful of hurting myself. And so if anything, I think, you know, at the young ages, you can be very, cautious around a moving saw blade and such so that was probably the beginning of of sort of the physical making journey which is most emblematic of of what i do today but also sort of a catalyst for thinking about how to be more sophisticated in design which probably led to an interest in studying something like architecture so after we did the standardized testing uh, and saw that we were you know pretty pretty much ahead of where we needed to be uh, with the exception of spelling um, my mom enrolled us in a correspondence school, I think around like seventh and eighth grade uh, for me. I think it was seventh grade for me. And this was through a, there, you know, there wasn't a lot of options. And I think she wanted just a little bit more structure. She felt like everything was in a good place, but just wanted to make sure she was staying on top of things as the subject matter got a little bit more complex with biology, uh, higher levels of mathematics and, and such. So she enrolled us in this sort of Christian correspondence school, uh, which I'm not going to name. Um, and in general, it was like a pretty good outline for the grade levels. There was a lot of sort of ideological things that were not presented as opinions, but were presented as facts, which, uh, again, I support people that have different views. Um, but I think it was a little misleading in terms of how they presented things as uh, clearly obvious that are actually in contention with a lot of smart people. And that's not to say that you shouldn't have the right or, or take the opportunity to teach your worldview, but it is helpful to let your children know that there are very intelligent people that strongly disagree with what you're about to learn. And the reason why I think that's important is I saw a lot of my homeschooled peers uh, that would sort of come over to play at our house and then be mixed in with some of the, the local neighborhood kids around the age of sort of like 13 through 15, uh, position the idea that the earth was only 5,000 years old um, and uh, had a very specific view about dinosaurs and man uh, at the same time. And they were shocked 
to learn that that wasn't the consensus view of their peers. And these aren't my areas of expertise. Uh, I tend to sort of lean towards the consensus of the group of the smartest people I know, which isn't always a consensus. Um, but it was, I thought they were so blindsided and kind of humiliated in that moment. So whether or not the parents should have taught them what they believed in, it probably would have helped them to sort of let them know that, hey, not everyone thinks this way. <laughs> this, is, this is pretty specific. So to see people get kind of blindsided uh, at a young age when you're kind of socially vulnerable to feeling stupid in front of kids your own age, I think that kind of does children a disservice. And, uh, you know, as much as I do respect parents sort of controlling the narrative for their children, be aware that you will not control it forever. And there'll be moments where someone that is more articulate than you has your child's ear. And if they start thinking that you were wrong about one thing, that thread can get unpulled into sort of a whole litany of resentments and feeling that the parents are intellectual frauds, which I saw happen quite a bit. Um, but, you know, not always as like, you know, utter hatred, but just as like, God damn it, like you really sort of fed us that and never, ever presented a different way. So I think that, again, sort of speaks to that liability of sort of single sourcing everything from one plot of land is that contaminant can be fully saturated. And that's where you can sort of get into the, the danger of long term carcinogenic exposure. Now, the ability to kind of tailor education to a child's curiosity, far and away, one of the strong points of education, you can shift art and creativity towards, in my case, woodworking. And history for me was always just such a beloved subject because it would start with a broad thing of a time period of what was happening. But that flexibility to go exactly where I wanted uh, to greater depths with autobiographies was astounding. So I think like the two examples that I probably spent like a year really focused on Robert Fulton, uh, who's partially sort of credited with inventing the sort of steamboat and George Washington Carver. You know, I think for a lot of kids at, at that age, those are kind of, you know, maybe like a week is spent on those things for, for partially, so a few hours. But I was allowed to kind of like do a deep dive, go down the rabbit hole. This is pre-YouTube, right? So get all these books about them. And I think those had sort of early... They were early presentations that somebody could kind of be this sort of weird technical polymath where they could kind of experiment, test, pull ideas and products out of things. I mean, the obsession that uh, George Washington Carver had with peanuts and yams and figuring out all the things he could do with them, all starting from the fundamentals of how to revitalize soil. I think that probably you know, as an inspiration, guides so much of what I do today, the, the sort of thinking, okay, broadly about sustainability, not making it just about sort of carbon and solar panels, but it's a general sort of impulse where you opportunistically look where you can innovate hands on with this sort of broader context of soil revitalization, or in my case, sustainability in mind. That ability to kind of see how people did it in the past see how they had a fruitful and productive and revered career while doing things that they were incredibly passionate and curious about is a great way to take history to autobiography and then let the sort of child sort of uh, sort of digest that all as they sort of plot their future and their sort of worldview of how they're going to approach things. In my TEDx talk, I talked a lot about the sort of influence of of Mark Twain on my brother and I, and it was very literal. And for us, I think it was that sort of sense of adventure. And I think that's the, 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 the strength of those books is that they're relatively young children, like leading these, you know, kind of dangerous and adventurous lives. And, you know, reading about sort of Huckleberry Finn's uh, uh, getting a raft and taking it down the river, uh, led my brother and I to sort of building a raft out of two liter soda bottles. We put them into burlap uh, bags and then would sort of uh, staple or tie those bags to like scrap pieces of plywood that we salvaged to make uh, boats that we could sail down the San Inez River when it was occasionally had water. So I think those, you know, 
it wasn't like we were like history. Okay, here's the sort of exact president's order and this is what each one did and here's the policy they did. But being able to tie that into history and what was happening at the time to interesting figures to then deep dive into those interesting figures to extrapolate sort of life lessons and abilities and ways of inquiring and self-development. Uh, just, just outstanding. I think another sort of anecdote that comes to mind was uh, my mom was always pretty good at having sort of a playful approach to education and was never afraid of trying to improve upon a textbook or in, in this case, a board game. So and I think this is backtracking a little bit to when we were younger, but we, she bought this game called the state game. And the goal of this game is to teach you to recognize the shapes of the state. But she quickly saw that and you would sort of roll the dice and you would land on a different state. And then you had to know the capital, the, the state bird and um, the order in which it was sort of founded. Or not the order which found it, the capital and the state bird and a few other sort of things about it. But it was ordered kind of weirdly. So she changed it. So she would put it, you know, and you sort of roll the dice. If you get the six, she changed it so you'd land on Delaware, right? Because it was the sixth state that was added to the union. And, you know, we'd play that game, you know, like once or twice a week. But to this day, like, I know that Dover is the capital of Delaware and Delaware is the sixth state in the union because it was just sort of ingrained. Um, and we liked playing that game because, you know, Board games are fun for kids and you kind of like the sort of mastery of memory and things like that. She had different sort of games with sort of like memory cards that were all different like species of birds from California and would, you know, kind of cut out magazines and make her own versions of those. So there was always that kind of like playful way of, of doing education. I think as we got older, you know, particularly into sort of algebra, um, that's where it was much more textbook, quiz, test that she would sort of administer. And I think the part that was strong there was if we got a problem wrong, we just kept working through it until we got it right. And then the class was over. So it wasn't like this sort of time kept, okay, we have this math class, then you get the quiz, and then you get a grade on the quiz, and you're done with that quiz, and hopefully you catch up there. There is that kind of time flexibility to we're not moving forward until this is done right, which I think from a self-motivation standpoint is quite strong uh, approach because it teaches you not just to survive your least favorite class, it teaches you that you have to get through it. Um, so it puts the, the emphasis not on kind of stalling your way through with a passing grade, but saying like, I get to be done with this when I efficiently and quickly pursue my way through. And I think that is a strength of homeschooling is that particularly how it sets you up for college is that there tends to be more of an emphasis on personal time management and you tend to get rewarded for doing something fast and accurate. Whereas when I did go to a public high school, there was, you know, even if you knew the answers from the beginning, your reward was being bored while everybody else was trying to catch up. So that time flexibility to either go slow when something's not clicking until you absolutely get it right and then move forward, I think is, is a little bit healthier than just trying to get, you know, 30 kids all through the subject matter where the fast thinkers are kind of struggling and the slow thinkers are like getting progressively and progressively farther behind. Now, that's not to say that everything is always sort of rosy. And when I think about the sort of fear of missing out part, as it relates to sort of socialization with peer groups, I would say the hardest part for me individually was probably around like 15 or 16. Um, I had sort of played youth football uh, up through sort of, you know, uh, eighth grade. And then, you know, it didn't really have an option to play sort of my freshman year when everyone was sort of in sort of freshman football. And I think my parents sort of saw that I was that was kind of like a, a, a missing out, right? Because a lot of the youth sports, they kind of stop at high school. And so my mom sort of inquired and sort of argued that since we paid property taxes, I should be allowed to play on the San Inez High School football team. So it took a while to kind of orchestrate that. 
Um, but eventually they kind of conceded and said, yeah, you can use our library. You can you know, play on the sports teams and, and, and those kind of things. So my sophomore year, I was able to play sort of junior varsity football. I wasn't attending the high school. Um, I was just playing uh, on, on the sports. And so I get dropped off, uh, made some, some really good friends on the football team. And, uh, you know, they, they, they were like, wait, wait, who are you? Like, we've never seen you around school. And now you're just showing up to, to play sports. Okay, weird, but go on. And the coaches uh, gave me the nickname homeschool, uh, which if I go to, you know, how like a lot of like hometowns, they have those bars where everyone gets together on the night before Thanksgiving. I think probably to this day, if I go to the Maverick in San Inez the night before Thanksgiving, one of my former teammates will will say, hey, homeschool. Um, and I was also doing martial arts at the time, which was sort of a very individualized passion. And one of the things that I could really deep dive in, it allowed me to do a lot more training that wasn't at the end of school. So I could really put my best in, uh, interest for it. So, but I think there was like a little sense of like, wait, socializing is becoming a lot more serious in those kind of early teenage years. I'm kind of not always as aware of what the sort of, you know, schoolyard consensus through recess and, or, you know, through lunchtime talking about music and TV shows and those kind of things. So there started to be, I feel, started feeling like I didn't have a good handle on the pop cultural references or slang that my peers had. I felt like I could compete with them athletically and just generally conversationally. But I almost felt a little bit like a foreign exchange student. Like they were all really nice and they liked me, but they also liked, they were kind of like amused by my kind of, uh, you know, I think my slang still probably sounded like the books I was reading. Um, and less like, you know, that constant sort of classroom environment of all your peers. And this is pre-internet and social media. So I think that actually would probably be a little bit alleviated now because kids can sort of look at other kids on video and content and kind of see how they're speaking. And you see a much more, I think, pervasive type of, of variations of slang and discourse and fashion and all those things. So I think those were the tougher years. Um, I ended up doing my senior year of high school. So kindergarten through 11th grade, entirely homeschooled. I had played junior varsity my sophomore year of high school on the, the high school football team. And then my junior year still was homeschooled, but I played on the varsity team. So I had some familiarity with a lot of the football players. I was invited to some of the parties and kind of had a loose association uh, with, with the other kids. But my education was entirely at home. Now, as a relatively kind of person that likes to tinker around and, and, and pursue individualistic things, I kind of really liked being on the football team. It kind of gave me this social anchor and an awareness of sort of peer groups, allowed me to start building uh, really good friendships with some of the other guys that played. And just felt like I just had just the periphery. I still had a little bit of self-doubt about how it would fit into like the broader social structure I mean, I'd seen Beverly Hills 90210, but I'd never really been in a classroom with a teacher and 30 other kids or, um, you know, eaten in the cafeteria or ridden a school bus or any of those kind of things or just walk the halls and knowing that, okay, the bell rings, you have to go here now or here's where you're supposed to go, which classrooms, all that kind of stuff. So there's a little apprehension, a little self-doubt. And I think in the meantime, I had sort of channeled my own sort of energy into what a adolescent boy thinks of as self betterment, which for me was building stuff and doing the, what I consider the more manly types of, of creative pursuits, woodworking. Um, and of course, martial arts. I grew up in the era that was like the golden era of action movies and jacked guys like, John Claude Van Damme, uh, the Terminator movies, Commando, Arnold, shout out to Arnold, like talk about like impactful figures for people my age. So I was very interested in lifting weights because that was something you could do on your own. I was very interested in martial arts because that's something you could do on your own time. And then I took, you know, classes from the first the military base in, in uh, Lompoc with some uh, 
some Air Force guys that started a karate school. Um, I competed and I ended up winning the, and again, a lot of karate titles are kind of bogus, like especially the strip mall kind of karate ones. Um, but I won the US KA, the United States Karate Alliance. And again, this is not a major thing, but they still sort of claim the thing and you get big trophies and you compete against a handful of other people at each one. Uh, I won the United States Karate Alliance under 18 national championships. And I think, yeah, and then the, the world championships in New Orleans. Again, no means, by no means, this is one organization that's pretty obscure. Um, but excelling in a thing, even if it's the thing that's not holistic or like the, you know, Olympics or, you know, uh, national spelling bees or stuff like that, it still does breed some sense of accomplishment or capability that does build confidence. So I was kind of aware that this wasn't like a real masterful thing, but I also knew that I was better at it than a lot of other people. So there was this way to kind of take whatever I was concerned about, and at least they had a channel for sort of doing the things that were really important, which is getting jacked and uh, uh, getting good at fake karate. So there was these sort of outlets to sort of deal with those things. And then the sort of, you know, high school sports was the way to sort of interconnect and, and intermingle. The reason I switched over from the sort of correspondence school, which I was still doing as a homeschooled kid into the sort of San Inez public high school, uh, was they changed some sort of, I think, rule on, on attendance to the school for sports, if I remember correctly. And I was going to have to attend full time to school if I wanted to, um, you know, continue to play my senior year of varsity football. I really wanted I didn't want to miss out on that. So we kind of, you know, had to do I think we had to do like a, another sort of aptitude test to sort of make sure I placed into the right grade from from the high school as like a transfer student. And they, you know, there was a little bit of patience required on my mom's standpoint of saying, collecting all these kind of weird transcripts from this, you know, podunk correspondence school and translating them into something that the high school would understand. That, that took a while, but eventually got it placed and I was admitted and ready to go. So I remember that summer was a very, the summer after my junior year was a very nerve wracking, but also super exciting one because I was going to go to a public school for the first time. I don't think I slept at all like the night before my first day of school. And yeah, I remember telling my, my friends, uh, Jordan and Josh, who also were on the football team, like, you know, okay, so, you know, what, you know where are we meeting? Are we all gonna go together? You know, don't, don't abandon me. I had sort of selected my courses and I, I felt like I, from talking to my peer groups that I, like from an educational and intellect standpoint, I was fine, um, but it was still new. So I wanted to make sure it wasn't, wasn't taking anything too hard where I was struggling and you don't have that kind of in classroom kind of ability to measure yourself. So I, I my first semester, I picked pretty easy classes like home economics and was my homeroom and you know history, which was taught by one of my football coaches, shout out to Mr. Smith. And, you know, nothing too challenging. I'd already kind of done up to algebra two. And so I didn't have to take math. Um, and I never thought about going to college. Um, neither one of my parents attended university and they really didn't push it. They always kind of said, oh, you know, you can, it's, college is good. That's where people go to get sort of higher end careers and make more money and be more sort of respected kind of uh, professional figures. And they always had kind of a reverence for, for upper education, but they always kind of said, you'll, you'll figure out what you want to do. And so it was always kind of a guidance and support rather than a push, push, push. Um, and there's pros and cons to that uh, because I wasn't pushed. I didn't take AP courses or, or anything like that. Um, I didn't take you know, classes that were going to look good on a college transcript. Um, I took things that I thought I could really just nail and really focus on, on having a lot of fun my senior year, which actually is, again, it's not the best for, 
for if, if you kind of know exactly what you want to do academically. But from a life development standpoint, like kind of awesome. Um, so I was talking to Jordan and Josh and I was like, okay, first day of school, like, you know, where are we meeting? I'm like, you know, should we take the bus? And they're like, no, dude, we, we drive, like we drive to school um, and we'll come pick you up. I was like, oh, I remember being like kind of, well, I want to, I want to take the bus because like, you know, I've never taken that and it, it's so iconic. And like, no, no, that's like something like the underclassmen uh, do. So I conceded, but eventually I did convince all my friends that lived in my neighborhood to all ride the bus just so I could kind of check that experience off the, off the bucket list. And so there was kind of like that enthusiasm because a lot of seniors have sort of senioritis, right? They're kind of burnt out, particularly the ones that have been like pushed by their parents to sort of prep for college and you've got to get the most and you got to nail all these extracurriculars. And most of my guy friends were just kind of playing football. Some of them were pretty smart and like, you know, we're going to go to college, but they didn't really talk about that in the social circle. A lot of my uh, female friends were much better students than my male friends. And they were like very focused. They were always, you know, they were literally playing sports to get to improve their kind of college chances. So I kind of was seeing that they were a little bit more stressed out by it. And I was like, no, no, this is about like, you know, playing sports and having fun and going to parties. And um, so again, the only reference I really had for what it would look and feel like other than anecdotes from my friends was, you know, Beverly Hills 90210 and a little bit of Saved by the Bell. And San Inez wasn't too far from that. Um, and it was so much fun. Um, so I think that I'd kind of gotten through the awkward phase. I had sort of a chance to sort of do some self-improvement. And it was kind of nice experiencing high school your first day as a senior. So you do have that kind of social apprehension of like, where do I fit in and what do I do? What are the social norms? But at least you're not a 14-year-old or a 13-year-old surrounded by 17-year-olds um, sort of coming in with sort of age under my belt and, you know, having traveled on my own for, for karate tournaments and, and had multiple jobs. I had worked at a dishwasher and done sort of construction and roofing and all these kind of things. There were, at least there was kind of like a physical and somewhat sort of emotional maturity as you're dealing with this sort of social dynamic about, around a bunch of peers. So it was really fun. Um, uh, immediately started to actually see that there was a huge benefit to instructional voices that were not my parents. Um, and particularly Mr. Smith, who taught the, the history class, he did all these little things like he would have a sort of like read the newspaper and we'd have to place bets or he'd have to pretend with fake money, like to buy stocks in the stock market and talk about investing. And a little foreshadowing is he would just sort of talk in general about sort of the world and how it was shaped and um, you know, his experiences as a Vietnam vet and, you know, he was a very strict, uh, a teacher, but, you know, a very kind and thoughtful one too. And I remember him saying like something, he was talking about like, you know, presidents and how, you know, so many of them go to Harvard and he was talking about the Ivy leagues and how this is this elite level of cultural institution in America and very few people get get into them and maybe only you know one or two of you out of this whole senior class uh will get into one of these universities and didn't really think much of it i just remember him talking with such reverence and how these things were important and because we sort of all respected him as sort of uh, the most disciplinary kind of like drill sergeant uh football coach that would yell at you uh if you you know your push-up form wasn't great and, but at the same time was like a thoughtful and empathetic uh, teacher in the classroom. It kind of like, huh, well, he's probably right. Um, but didn't, didn't think anything of it. Didn't like immediately kernel some sort of deep desire. It just created that foreshadowing that would come into play later. So first semester, senior year, uh, yeah, basically I was like the foreign exchange student. I wanted to eat in the cafeteria. I wanted to do all these things. I was like excited for everything that a lot of the other seniors in my year were not. But I think they kind of enjoyed my enthusiasm for things that they were getting burnt out on, right? Like friends in New York don't want to go to Times Square. Um, but if someone news there for the first time, they'll be like, okay, this, this could be kind of fun to go see it. So it was good. Uh, 
it felt easy. Um, granted, I took easy classes. So my second semester, I took like an, uh, an English lit class um, that was, I think, I don't know if it was AP or not, but it was more advanced. There was like the smart kids were in it. And that was the first sort of inclination. I was like, oh, yeah, all these books that were assigned, you know, the catchers and the rye and those kind of things. Uh, I think they assigned us Pride and Prejudice, which I don't really think is like senior level, but it's what, it's what we got. And these are books I'd all read before. Um, and so I was like, oh, wow, I, I didn't realize that there was this kind of academic rigor placed on just books that I read for entertainment. Um, and so that was what I was thinking, huh, you can get kind of, it was the first time I kind of saw that you can be seen as smart simply from having read books that you enjoy. And so that made me think that, well, maybe academics aren't this kind of tedious thing that, and again, I think this is the strength of my parents sort of introducing them early as like thoughtful forms of enjoyment um, rather than things you have to read so that you can then write a synopsis of. Um, allowed me to sort of a, let sort of curiosity and allowed sort of a positive motivation for doing well in school in that in that sort of environment. So I got really good grades. Again, I was taking the easiest classes, but I think I had, I was tied for the highest grade point average on the football team, took very little college prep courses, didn't know what the SATs were. I kind of heard that everyone was stressed about them from like sort of junior year to, to first semester, senior year. Didn't really think anything of it. Just figured I would either become like a wildfire a firefighter, like which my two best friends were going to do. Um, maybe go to community college. Wasn't really sure what to do afterwards, but had an absolute blast. Went to all the parties. Um, just a, a, a ton of fun. Uh, really got comfortable within a sort of a social scene. And then when I graduated, uh, I got a job working at a Bellman at a local hotel. Um, started saving money by car, took sort of odd construction jobs, was working full time. And then so I said, okay, you know, these things are fine and, you know, but like can't do this forever. I was still uh, teaching martial arts and still competing a little bit. Um, I got sponsored a couple times by Power Bar back in the day in a local plumbing supply uh, place. Shout out to Todd's uh, Plumbing in Bealton. Um, but there wasn't any money in it. I think I won like a few hundred bucks here or there on uh, things. And most of that was spent on travel. So was started thinking, okay, what do I want to do? And sort of construction or firefighting were kind of like the things that my peer group was doing. But I still knew that I was pretty good at sort of making stuff. And always, you know, I took some art and design courses in, in high school, did really well in those. And the teachers sort of said, oh, you know, you're, you're pretty good at this. Um, so architecture seemed like a good thing. Previous episode, I talked about my sort of choices and, and what it was like going to architecture school. But, you know, I started thinking, OK, well, how do I really do that? And I decided to sort of test out college with Santa Barbara Community College. And this is where I get into like the idea of supplementation. Now, the sort of single sourced homeschooled approach of hands on from the people that care about the kids the most is great. But as I said, it's vulnerable to whatever deficiencies the parents have. Community colleges are a great way to supplement to homeschooling because they're low cost. There's a lot of them. A lot of the teachers at community college are awesome. And Santa Barbara Community College in particular, because, you know, having taught at uh, multiple universities, tenure track and high level universities is stressful. If you're teaching at a community college in Santa Barbara, one, you live in a great place. And two, it's not that it, there isn't the sort of politicking. You can really just focus on being an excellent instructor. So you might not be a thought leader in your field, but you can really focus on the highest quality improvement in education for the kids, which frankly, at a lot of the, the, the universities I've been at, either as a student or as an academic, sometimes the focus of faculty is on their research and uh, getting tenure track more than it is on each individual student's improvement. So 
I took community college classes. Uh, I sort of worked them around. I was working full time, 40 hours a week and then taking like odd, you know, construction jobs on weekends to kind of make a little bit of extra money and save, bought a car, um, all that kind of stuff. And started seeing that a lot of the, the kids that have gone off to college that I went to high school were doing interesting things and like, you know, around a whole new peer group. And again, a little bit of FOMO started kicking in that was sort of triggered a motivational response in myself. And so I said, okay, community college is pretty easy with each sort of additional, and I'd kind of like started with sort of the general sort of college prep courses, a little higher degree of mathematics, um, a little more English, uh, physics, which, which, was, which a, was a lot of fun, and started sort of building out that educational base and figured out, do community college for two years and then sort of apply to four-year universities. Started leaning towards architecture as the sort of topic, but definitely kept some other options open. Took drafting courses, stuff like that. So it went well. I got really good grades. Community college is high school with an ashtray. And it's kind of, I mean, it was kind of nice to be in a small pond where you could really get used to dominating and excelling around a mediocre peer group. But that still left the fear of like, well, I'm doing well at a community college. How does this stack up against a really good university? So I remember after sort of two years, I took the SATs and, you know, I did, I did like a practice test, sort of got, okay, here's what's, this is roughly what it is. Oh, yeah, this seems all uh, pretty doable. Took the SATs, my TA85 or 83, I can't remember which one it was, sort of died on me halfway through, which is sort of, so I thought math was going to be my kind of, my anchor, the thing that I was, you know, that I knew I could just, the subjective, I know the subject matter. I'll probably get, you know, 95% of them right. I'll make a mistake here or there, but mostly I'll get them right. I felt like I understood it holistically and completely. Um, English, I was like, yeah, I can, I can sort of write the essays and, and do the sort of analytical kind of stuff. But, but did well on the SATs. Um, I've gotten like the, I think like the 1440s to sort of 1480 range. And my sort of guidance counselor, counselor at the sort of, or, I hired a private guidance counselor to sort of prep me for school, save my money, paid for that. It was expensive for me. It was like a couple thousand dollars, which was a lot of money back then. Um, and she was like, well, you know, she's like, I wasn't really sure because you were homeschooled and you have these weird transcripts, but you've done well with sort of community college. You know, how do you get into, you know, she wasn't really sure how I would get into a, a four-year school. So sorry about that. I got interrupted by a dog. Um, getting into college. So took the SATs, did pretty well. My private sort of guidance counselor that I hired uh, sort of said that, hey, you know, you can, you can get into some good places. So that's when I started looking at sort of architecture programs. And I started by sort of US News World Reports kind of rankings and said, oh, Cornell, that's the number one undergraduate architecture program. Okay, well, might as well start there. And Again, my uh, history teacher, uh, Coach Smith, uh, sort of words were kind of echoing that like, wow, that's an Ivy League school. This is, you know, the most prestigious things. Didn't really know anyone that had, had been to those. I think uh, one or two kids from uh, my uh, high school got into Columbia and then another one into Harvard. And they were considered like, the smartest kids. And I was like, oh, I don't really know if I'm, if I'm at that level, but... Um, give it a shot, sort of looked at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, which was a school that some of my other kind of homeschooled kids, uh, friends sort of got into for like kind of engineering programs and stuff like that. So, okay, that's sort of like, you know, if I want to stay more local, I know a lot of people in that area, it's not too far from my hometown. That's sort of the backup and a few other programs I, I looked as well and applied. Um, I got into just about everywhere except Cornell. And, you know, hugely disappointed. Um, I had looked at kind of like their average test scores and kind of been like, you know, I'm kind of above that. And was kind of, you know, uh, not surprised because I didn't really have an expectation, but was a little confused as to, you know, I wanted a why. And so I called the admissions department on the phone 
and sort of asked them. It took a while and they called me back and eventually they got me to sort of talk to someone on admissions and they're like, well, you know, you know, your portfolio was, was decent because you have to submit a portfolio for undergrad architecture. And that's looked in addition to sort of your transcripts and test scores. And they're like, your portfolio is not great. And your interview, because you have to also do an interview, um, you didn't get that great of a score on the interview po uh, portion of it. And for interviews, you have sort of two options. You can go to the school and interview with faculty directly, or you can interview with a local alumni. And I just figured, oh, it's a lot of travel just for an interview. Like, I'll just do, you know, drove to L.A. and did an interview with, a, with an architecture alumni. And the interview I had with the alumni, he talked the whole time about himself, asked me very few questions, just told me how hard the school was and how difficult it was, was kind of like not paying attention to the questions, sort of scribbled a couple notes. And, you know, I don't really feel like I got a full shake, but, you know, no one's ever heard of him and he hasn't really gone on to do much anyway. So maybe just a disgruntled uh, uh, alumni that wants to sort of gatekeep. At least that's my uncharitable uh, narration of it. But he was uncharitable to me, so uh, and, and didn't see the immense potential that was there. So I jest. But so I said, okay, I could go to USC for business, uh, or I could go to some of these other school pro architecture programs that I got in, and or I can kind of you know wait a full year and reapply to Cornell. And I decided to do the latter. And figured that, you know, a backup school would always be a backup school. So that meant waiting another year, the sort of third gap year. So I said, well, first let's focus on portfolio. So I took a study abroad course through uh, Santa Barbara Community College. Again, the power of supplementation through low cost uh, community colleges. Absolutely fantastic it, while you're figuring things out without building up sort of massive student loan. So went to Florence and did a semester there, stayed on for a little while afterwards and just kind of traveled around, got to see a little bit more of the world, um, really focused on freehand drawing, which is still not a strength. But I mean, if you're going to sit around and draw buildings, you might as well do that in Italy. Um, made another great group of friends and just had this broader kind of cultural experience, um, reapplied with my sort of updated, uh, <laughs> my updated uh, uh, portfolio, which I'll still do a video about eventually, and traveled to Cornell in person to do my interview. And I remember sort of flying into Ithaca, New York. It was during the winter, super cold. My kind of California jacket was way, way under insulated for, for how cold it was. Um, I was 21 years old at the time, so I could like go to the bar so I could, you know, I was applying to be a freshman, but, you know, uh, was as old as a lot of juniors or seniors and was kind of like, wow, you know, you, everything here looks like a castle. This, it felt like almost like parts of Europe that I had just seen. And it was like, it was kind of mesmerizing. Again, you know, thinking back to my sort of high school history teacher that had talked about how these are sort of these prestigious ancient universities. There was kind of this appeal that, like, wow, these are these are much more his substantial institutions historically than the things I saw in California. I knew that, like, you know, Stanford, UCLA, Berkeley, you know, great great schools, um, but they felt newer and they felt California and. I remember thinking the interview, you know, the, the night before the interview, went out to a local bar, got drunk with a bunch of uh, older students, kind of saw that it was going to be fun, and met some guys on the hockey team um, and took shots with them. You know, didn't get too hungover from my my big interview the next day. But I remember thinking, like, OK, I want to do well in this. I, this is someplace I want to go. Um, interviewed with a professor named John Miller, who would later teach my second year uh, course on architectural analysis. And he has this kind of old uh, gravelly voice, kind of a Clint Eastwood vibe. And he's like, oh, so you're applying again. 
And he's like, you, you didn't get into anywhere else? And I was like, no, I got into other schools. I just really want to go to this. And I think that above anything else kind of had him write a good recommendation, which uh, eventually got me in, was I think that people do like seeing a sense of determination, especially when it's like self-motivated and not sort of externally kind of pressured or, or coming from the parents. Um, I told him what I had sort of done to sort of improve my portfolio by sort of spending time in Italy. He thought that was awesome. Um, but anyways, got into Cornell, which was outstanding, and uh, the architectural education uh, began, which is in the, the first video I posted in this series. So I refer to that to see how that went. But in looking back on like how being homeschooled prepares you for this, the self-education, the self-improvement part, hugely in its favor, um, I think... Our family didn't really travel. I think the farthest we had sort of traveled was to Hawaii where we did like road trips to like Oregon to go salmon fishing. So it was a little bit more like kind of like wholesome, folksy, kind of outdoorsy kind of travel. There wasn't really like this kind of like worldly exploration of European cities. And I think that kind of stuff is would probably be a very beneficial supplement because then you can kind of really focus on the individual needs, educational needs of the child at home with sort of curriculum tailored to them, but then mixing that in with something on the other end of the spectrum of like international travel or road trips across the US and really exploring different lifestyle aspects, not just different, you know, recreational aspects of, of American life, I think could broaden that. Um, so there is that opportunity with the time flexibility uh, that you know, probably if I would have started that earlier, probably would have gotten in the, the, the first time, but, you know, ultimately it sort of worked out. I would say that, you know, not getting in the first time definitely put a chip on my shoulder, which sort of launched me to propel aggressively into academia and to kind of prove that I belong there. Because I looked at all the kids that were one year older than me as being like, that's the year I didn't get into. So these kids, every one of these kids took a spot that I didn't get. And made it like my sort of personal mission to to uh, do better them in any time I could go sort of head to head to that with them academically. Um, you know, pettiness is not a great motivation for a happy life, but it certainly is productive for 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 self drive here and there. Um, but again, I would say sort of broader kind of lifestyle cultural exploration would be a good supplement. Um, a lot of the other homeschool kids that I knew that were a little bit younger than me kind of started around sort of the age of 16, taking one or two classes at a community college in subject matter that their parents weren't particularly well skilled in. Um, I think particularly, you know, things like biology or physics um, or, you know, calculus. If you're sort of at, at the upper end of a high school spectrum and your parents aren't really rock solid in those subject matters, taking, seeing if you can get to take one or two courses at a community college could be that kind of really nice balance. The other thing that is, from a time standpoint, I've been re you know, reading sort of studies about sort of the importance of sleep and sort of human development. And I think from just a general health standpoint, that might be the most sort of, or I think we'll probably end up seeing the most evidence for the benefits of homeschooling is in the ability to let kids sleep until they're no longer tired, um, as opposed to getting up early to get food in them, get them out the door, you know, to a school bus, and then, you know, figuring out how to pick them up and, and get them back. That kind of not having that sense of institutional urgency first thing in the morning that, you know, the developing brain and body can, can be fully rested before you start to try to solve problems um, I mean, that's probably the most luxurious component of homeschooling. That's also probably the most objectively healthy part. So, you know, I think the other thing that was nice is we developed pretty good eating habits. Um, I'm probably the only one of my siblings that like actively or aggressively exercises, but everyone's in very good kind of from a body mass index standpoint, um, 
in really enjoys eating healthy and knows how to cook and, and do all these things that sort of came directly from that sort of day-to-day -day interaction with my parents. Um, so I think there's some really nice kind of benefits. So the other thing too, that you start to see more and more when I look back is a surprising number of like high achievers in a very specific field that homeschooled out of necessity. So homeschooling is pretty common for Olympic athletes um, or tennis players or people that really need to put a lot of time into it. I certainly was none of those, but yeah, that for me, it was a, uh, and definitely not Olympic level woodworking, <laughs> but I did have plenty of time to dab dabble in that in martial arts. So yeah, I think occasional supplementation with high, higher end education um, mixed in with probably a little bit more travel. I think that's the sort of nutritional educational component I missed uh, would really sort of well round that for college. Also, I ended up sitting on admissions at Cornell because I stayed on after I graduated to teach there. And so it was kind of fun. You know, I didn't start college till I was 21, but by the time I was 27, I was faculty at an Ivy League school. Uh, a little humble brag there, but um, I got put onto sort of admissions and I would sort of interview students and, and sort of look at them. And, you know, everyone had good test scores. And I started to sort of see, oh, that's how my sort of scores looked. Everyone had good test scores. But some kids would speak to adults like an adult. And other kids, you know, had only had conversations with their peer group. And we're saying things like, and a lot of those kind of vocal fry and kind of like teenage vocal tendencies that they were kind of struggling to shift into a more formal conversational thing with someone that was going to uh, partially determine their fate of admittance. So I think one of the advantages that I had was one, I'd always sort of hung out with my older brother and his friends. So that kind of like forced the level of discourse a couple of years older. And then also you spend so much time in conversation around academic topics with your parents. And so having had a lot of conversations about history and economics with my mom and dad, uh, I at least had a lot of reps with talking to adults about sort of serious subject matter. And I think that sort of bodes well for anything that's in sort of an interview standpoint. The other thing that there's in, for whatever disadvantages from having a less common educational path, there are advantages in a sea of super qualified, high test score, run of the mill students. Um, and this may change as homeschooling becomes more prevalent, but at least you have like an initial kind of thing of like, huh, well, that's a different approach. So I'm not sure that everyone I know would, would, would find homeschooling get into a, an advantage for getting into college, but it certainly is possible. Um, I think there are some studies now, which, you know, do your own research on, uh, that sort of indicate sort of a general trend for homeschooled kids to have pretty decent test scores, if not higher than average. And, you know, now I think there's a lot of examples of kids that were sort of partially homeschooled uh, that have gotten into sort of the top universities. So definitely doesn't preclude it. Um, definitely creates advantages and disadvantages for it, but uh, I'm mostly happy with how it worked out. So looking back now at the age of 45 at how formative homeschooling was, it's hard for me to be completely objective. I am incredibly grateful for how my life has worked out. I can't imagine it having turned out better in terms of sort of the creative freedom that I'm able to do with my career now, the places I've been able to travel to, the people I've met, all those things, 10 out of 10 wouldn't change a thing. I don't have a counterfactual, right? I don't have my life uh, lived through the entire sort of institution of, of elementary through sort of high school. So I can only speak sort of broadly to, to, to concepts that I see as being different and the, the strengths and weaknesses that those sort of enabled. In general, when I look at me and my siblings, there's kind of a independent sort of entrepreneurial thinking and not necessarily in the business sense that we're going to build these massive companies or do all this stuff, but just a, there isn't a adherence to the status quo. 
and there's sort of a risk taking to try to make a life their own way. My brother has a farm and like grows all of his own food and raises animals in Argentina, right? Like incredibly interesting and nuanced life. He's now started a chocolate and a seed company down there. Has always kind of done his own thing um, and had a variety of different careers that all were very specific to what and who he wanted to be. Emily, the older of my two younger sisters, ended up going to UCLA and got a bachelor's degree from an excellent university in, in archaeology, has worked as sort of a, as at the university and then now works in a lot of sort of uh, public forward kind of institutions in California. Jesse was a uh, esteemed violinist and, and just an incredible musician and now works with me and blacksmiths and lives life entirely on her own terms. So I think in those sort of early formative years where it doesn't answer the questions of like what should you do, how you should spend your time, but it really forms that the answers are what you choose to do and not what your peers are doing. So even the removal of that sort of day-to-day -day discussions of, hey, where should we go to college? Or have you done the prep for the SATs? They certainly cost me a few years from going to college right after high school. But I think they also gave me a conviction of when I was spending my own money and my own time on college, that I was going to milk that thing for everything I could get out of it of value. And so it turned me into more a consumer of education than someone that was enduring education. It made it very self-directed because I didn't have to do it. Now, that's not specific to homeschooling. That could just be parents that are using public school systems and just not pushing and just introducing a broad thing. But the schedule flexibility, I think, is pretty undeniable. And I spoke already to the sort of advantages I see it from the sort of sleep uh, standpoint. But that kind of interest development, that your hobbies and pursuits are not at the expense of social time, that I could pursue woodworking, I could pursue martial arts while other kids were in a class that they were either too smart for or just barely getting through. That is, I think, a, a inherent advantage of sort of time flexibility. And that the schedule of, that this, the learning schedule was me driving, not me learning history for two hours and then running to a different class for, for an hour and then another class for an hour, which isn't really a good way to think deeply about anything. Uh, we would have whole weeks where we didn't do any math and we just focused on history. And we'd have whole weeks where we were struggling through um, uh, a level of math and not doing any uh, history. So that, that ability to kind of deep dive, I think is, and again, I'm not a child development specialist, but I think it's more conducive to learning. And even when I think about how I learn as a maker and designer, I'll often experiment with something as a way of learning rather than read everything about it. I learned more from being on construction sites uh, about designing buildings than I did from some of the technical building classes. Why? Well, because at the time of those classes, they were early in the morning. I was mostly concerned about design studio and they were low intellectual priority, even though later on, six years later, the knowledge that I kind of missed there or didn't put as a high of priority as I would later sort of value it, kind of just did studied for the test. So all I know is that once I started paying for education uh, in the form of student loans, I really did have the approach that this was for me, this was what I wanted, and this was what I was going to extract every ounce of value from it, even though I kind of missed it with sort of not always focusing on all the right things. But I think it set up a good relationship with education in general. I think another important thing to consider is what it will do to sort of family relationships when you spend more time together. Um, I spent more time with my siblings and my parents than I think most kids do. I have a great relationship with all of them to this day. Jesse works with me. So, you know, he's also a business partner in addition to uh, a close confidant. But again, you know, kind of looking at the other my homeschooled peers from the same sort of age group, I don't see that being consistently the case. I see a lot of estrangement that's probably over indexes versus, you know, 
typical sort of educational paths. And that's alarming and to be uh, concerned about. I don't think it's coincidental that the where you see the most estrangement, you also saw the most autocratic control or the most sort of severe religiously motivated uh, sort of rules uh, for the kids and where the outside world was seen as an evil and mistrusted thing that was to be avoided for this sort of little insular homeschooled bubble. Well, those kids seem to be kind of struggling when they're left, when they eventually have to leave that homeschool bubble and interact with that world. They can be very fearful, mistrustful, or very naive in some cases. And you can't escape reality. You can sort of protect your kids from aspects of it. Um, but eventually they'll have to sort of, you know, sink or swim on their own and are you really expecting them to, to go out there with something they have no reps in? So I think those are the things that I would sort of consider. People often ask me, oh, with your own kids, will you homeschool them? No idea. Totally depends. Depends on the individual. Depends on where we live. Um, it depends on where they show specific interests. I think it's a really good thing to have as an option. I think it could be an option in sort of two ways. It can be an option to sort of uh, see something that isn't going well. And as a way to sort of, you know, potentially remedy that or to address something that may be of concern. Um, or I see it could be a, as an accelerant, as you're seeing a certain aptitude in a specific area and a real desire to go more deep into that particular subject or interest. And it's a way to kind of test to see how strong that bond is. Um, but... I think it definitely is like sort of a case by case basis. I think in sort of retrospect, um, I think my parents mostly got it right, but I think probably I'm not speaking for my older brother, but I think he probably a couple of years in high school probably would have uh, uh, certainly been neutral, but if potentially even better for his sort of uh, social development. Um, he certainly made up for it by having a lot of fun afterwards and is just a fantastic person that everybody loves. Um, but I, th I think it's really dependent on the individual. Look, my siblings all come from the same parents. We have genetically different responses to different foods. Um, I think two of us are lactose intolerant. I'm not. Uh, and two, two of us are totally fine with dairy. Um, you know, two of them kind of have an adverse reaction to, to alcohol where they kind of turn red. They get the, the Asian glow. And I've never had that problem, right? So within sort of genetic similar sort of stock, seeing that there's strong biological differences in terms of what we can eat and drink, it only makes sense that there's going to be, you know, the brain, I think is a little bit even more complex. There's going to be different responses to different educational strategies and schedules. So by no means is this my sort of like definitive take on the subject matter. What I'm trying to do with this series is create a scheduled incentive for myself to talk about a topic that I do think is interesting or important to me. And I see it sort of as like a first draft towards a bunch of other sort of media products. Eventually, I'm probably going to do another book or two. Um, I might do some more sort of polished talks around specific subject matter where it's much tighter, like a real short, like 15 to 20 minutes. It's my definitive take. But with the sort of advent of large language learning models, I feel an increased motivation to sort of get initial first draft thoughts recorded and on record. And I'll sort of continue to do these as a way to sort of talk about things that I want, see what questions come back from you, the audience. So hit me up with all the questions related to this topic in the, the comment section below. And eventually, I don't know when, I'll do a follow-up on that, um, either in a written form or in uh, another one of these kind of video podcasty kind of things. Um, but I look forward to the day where I have enough of these where I can basically have a conversation with my myself and kind of refine it and have a language learning model that sort of speaks in my voice, that is aware of 
at least the verbal translation of my experiences, probably not, I don't think we're there yet technologically for it to be an actual intellectual translation of those experiences, but that'll make it that much easier for me to sort of produce more comprehensive and tightly edited sort of written and verbal work. So that's the sort of goal. This is the sort of training session draft mode uh, podcast formatted versions of my thoughts on homeschooling. So please uh, like, share this if you feel appropriate to the, to the thing. Um, really appreciate those that watch to the entire end. The longer you watch of each one of these videos, the more likely we are, the more frequency we'll make more of them. And also uh, let me know additional topics that you would like us to dive into. All right, that's it. Thanks. Bye.